Are we still in First John? I think so. <laughs> no, are we going back to chapter one? No, no, you're not. Turn to First John chapter three, verses four through ten. Chapter three. Wow, oh, I didn't know we were that far. I'm, I'm cruising along, cruising along. Hear God's holy and inspired word this morning. Everyone who makes a practice of sinning also practices lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. You know that he appeared in order to take away sin and that in him there is no sin. No one who abides in him keeps on sinning. No one who keeps on sinning has either seen him or known him. Little children, let no one deceive you. Whoever practices righteousness is righteous as he is righteous. And whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil, for the devil has been sinning from the beginning. Um, uh, the reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. No one born of God makes a practice of sinning, for God's seed abides in him, and he cannot keep on sinning, because he has been born of God. By this it is evident who are the children of God and who are the children of the devil. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is the one who does not love his brother. Let's pray. Uh, dear Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you so much for the opportunities that we've had to gather, to study, to praise. And Lord, I just pray that you would personally work in me today to feed your congregation, to feed your people the words that you want them to hear and the truths that you want them to hear out of what we just read. We thank you, Lord, for your word. We thank you, Lord, that you've given us your spirit so that we can draw near to you and understand you better. Lord, I just pray that you would bind Satan away from this place, that we'd be able to focus in on your word by the power of your spirit, by the power of your blood, Lord. Fill each of us with your Holy Spirit today. Help us to draw near to you through the word. And we say this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I think many of you know I was trained to evangelize in something called Evangelism Explosion. And evangelism Explosion is a training on how to witness. And in Evangelism Explosion, you learn certain analogies, you learn certain um, ways of communicating the gospel, because as you know, if you've communicated with people who aren't saved, they don't readily understand their predicament. They don't readily understand the situation that they're in. And so you can tell them the words, you know, hey, you're on your way to hell and you need Jesus, which is fine to do. I mean, that's the gospel. But what God has given us is some uh, the ability to come up with these analogies to help people kind of understand their situation. So one analogy was the egg analogy. I think you've probably heard this before, especially if you've been out with me to witness, and that is uh, if you have an egg, like let's say I'm making you an omelet, and I, you know, I'm talking to an unbeliever, and I'm like, hey, I'm making you an omelet, and I have five eggs, and uh, one of them's rotten, would you eat that omelet? And they say, well, no, I wouldn't eat that omelet. I said, well, if I tried to reason with you, hey, it's mostly good eggs. Have you ever smelled a bad egg? They're pretty bad, right? I mean, you wouldn't eat it even if I put salsa on it, even if I put cheese in it, even if I put all other kind of good ingredients in it, you still wouldn't eat that egg because you still wouldn't eat that omelet because one of those eggs is bad. And how much worse our life is with Christ when we try to cover it up with all of of our sins and if we only commit three sins a day well that's like I don't know how many sins 70,000 sins on your record if you live to be so many years old well I've actually come up with an analogy myself that helps the unbeliever understand that sin is not funny that sin is lawlessness and here it is and this is what I think people need to understand today when they're thinking about God and they're thinking about their relationship with God and that is everybody knows what it's like to be offended everybody knows what it's like to have be slandered everybody knows what it's like to have somebody undermine your authority it's not fun when somebody offends you it isn't just like when somebody like oh they do something bad to you well that's bad but when you you feel deeply offended by something 
you tend to resent it, you tend to be upset with that person. And it doesn't matter how many more good things that person does compared to the offense. It doesn't matter. So if I offended you, I speak ill of you, I, you know, I undermine your authority in some way, I do something bad to you, we've all had that experience. And then I say, hey, I'm gonna come live in your house. And they say, well, why would you come live in my house? I said, well, look, I'm a good person, man. I don't cheat on my taxes. I, you know, I have a good home life and all this stuff. It wouldn't matter. The offense between me and you is not healed. You wouldn't accept that person into their home. And as a matter of fact, if you were in that person's home, there would be a point in which, God, in which the owner of the home would push you out entirely. And what the unbeliever doesn't understand is that we are living in God's house. Just like if I moved into your house and I started saying, you know, well, you, you have a house, you know, you have a place, you have rules at your place, you have things that you like done, you like them done a certain way, and you have your own reasons for doing them. Some of them might be, uh, you know, blasé reasons, some of them, but while you're there, I'm in your house, I need to obey your rules, right? I mean, you would be upset if I didn't obey your rules. Well, we're all in God's house. All of us are born. This universe is God's universe. We're not in his house in the sense that, you know, like he's confined to some area. You know, you understand what I mean, right? And when you say, I like to do it my way, I don't like to obey your laws. I don't like to obey what, you're, what you have prescribed for me to do. That's just as offensive to God as if I moved into your house and I said, you know what, I know you have that rule about, you know, taking off your shoes when I come in or whatever your rule is or putting away the dishes or, you know, not slapping your brother or sister, or whatever the rules are. If I just said, you know what, I don't like it your way. I'm going to go ahead and do it my way. I'm just going to go ahead and slap it. You would not put up with that lawlessness for a moment. Well, you, you might put up with it for a moment, but after a while, you'd be like, I'm done with this. You are not staying here anymore. Well, we serve a God who is ultra patient. He lets sinners into this world. He lets sinners into his metaphorical house, So that, we, as I'm using the analogy here. But there's going to come a day when he pushes all those people out because the offense is too large because he won't put up with lawlessness just like you wouldn't put up with lawlessness. And here what we have is a great description of what sin is. As a matter of fact, it says it here in verse 4. If you look at verse 4, everyone who makes a practice of sinning also practices lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. In other words, there's a standard in which God has and which you are being lawless by sinning because you're breaking that standard. This morning, I want to talk about three things with you. I want to talk about this rebellion, this lawlessness. I want to talk about the nature of rebellion or the nature of lawlessness. And then I want to talk about you as a Christian, your new relationship to lawlessness is now different. And the third thing I want to talk about is the reason your nature or the reason your relationship with lawlessness is now different. So those are the three things I want to talk about. So I'm going to switch the last two when I get to them. But I want to talk about a definition of rebellion, you as a Christian, your new relationship to rebellion. And then the third thing I want to talk about is the reason for this new relationship to rebellion. So first of all, we see here, look once again at verse four. It says, everyone who makes a practice of sin also practices lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. Sin is a form of rebellion. Think for just a moment what you do when you're saying, when you, when you know that God wants you to do something, when God says, I have a standard, and you decide to break that standard, here's what you're really saying. You're saying your way is right. You're saying your way is better. Not just right, but better. You understand that? It's a, there's a difference between something being right and something being better. But you're saying both when you're talking about God's law. Think about the first sin with Adam and Eve and that fruit in which Satan enticed Eve to partake of that fruit. And she knew that God said, don't eat the fruit. And when she ate the fruit, what was she really saying? 
she was saying, you know what? God's way is inferior and God's way is wrong and my way is right. And when we sin, we're saying God's way is inferior to what I want. And God's way is wrong or antithetical to what I want. My way is the right way and your way is the wrong way. It's not just a matter, it's better, but it's not just a matter of being better. It's a matter of saying that God's way is wrong. Like I might want to get to the store, to Harmon's and you know, you might go out this way to the, to the light and turn up that way. And I might go over here and go up that way. And we can argue about which one's better. But, you know, but, but we're both getting to Harmon's. We're both going to Harmon's. But you see, we can have an argument over whether or not my way is better or whether or not your way is better. And you might say things like, well, going this way is safer because there's a light. I might say, yeah, but going this way is better because it's because it's quicker. We might have that conversation, but neither one of us are saying your way is wrong. Now, if you told me I want to go to Harmon's and I'm going to go down to the light and I'm going to hang a right and then you end up at Walmart, I can say your way's wrong, not just better. But when we rebel against God, that's what we're saying. We're not just saying our way's better. We're saying our way's better and your way's wrong. What you're doing is wrong. I would be better off. I would be I, my way is superior when we transgress God's law. We are saying our way is right, our way is better. The second thing we are doing is we are challenging God's authority. We are challenging God's authority when we sin. Just like when somebody comes into your house, to bring it back to that analogy, you, you can all think of a rule that you have in your home. You can all think of something that's on your mind. You know, I say, think of a rule that you have in your home, like I don't like this, or we do it this way at our house, or something like that. And if I come in and I say, well, actually, we're going to do it my way. I'm challenging your authority. I'm saying you don't, whenever I challenge your authority, I am not just challenging the fact that my way is better or right. I'm saying that I have the right to rule in this area and you do not. I'm challenging your authority. The third thing that happens with this definition is we're challenging God's love. We're saying that he's not doing the most loving thing for us. Do you understand that? God sets these rules up and he sets these regulations up. Sometimes our rules and our regulations are not always the loving thing. It's just the way we like to do it. You know, it's just the way we have it. It's the way that it's, that it's in our mind. It's the way that our, our brain works and therefore we like it that way. But when God sets up rules, he's setting up the most loving way to do something. And when we decide that God's ways aren't the best way, when we challenge his authority in that area, when we challenge his right in that area, we're also challenging his love. We're saying, you're not doing the most loving thing by me, or you're not doing the most loving thing for this world. That is what sin is. Whenever we rebel against sin, we are rebelling against his love. We are rebelling against his authority. We are rebelling against the actual rules saying that our way is better. I'm going to have it my way. Well, let me just say this in closing on that part. There's going to come a day when God will get rid of all of that. There's going to come a day where he will not put up with it anymore. And just like some little kid coming into your house, there's, there's no question about what, you know, what, what you could, you could pick that little kid up and just chuck him out. I don't like what you're doing. Oh yeah, you don't like what I'm doing? Well, there's the door, mister. You see, hell, hell as bad as it is, and I'm not undermining it at all, uh, it's, it's going to be eternal conscious punishment, but hell is ultimately saying, God, you don't like the way I do things? You're going to see what life is like without all graces. Because there's no grace in hell. You know, friends in hell. There's nothing good about hell. That's a place where all grace is rescinded forever. Because everything good is something that God gives us. If everything good is something God gives, you understand that. Like we have a lot of bad things we deal with, but everything good is something God gives us. So you're a good person. You bring donuts to work, right? You bring donuts, people come in. Now, you, let's say you have a, a, a somebody that doesn't like you, right? They don't like you. They have a, a bad, they have a bad disposition towards you, but they'll come into the office and eat your donuts. 
they'll walk in and oh hi all you're not doing that person anything wrong by saying okay you can't have my donuts anymore you can't have them anymore you're excluded from this you've done that person no wrong they can't share in what you bring that's good and not share in you well there's going to come a point everything that we have that's good comes from god everything where god will rescind all goodness and people say the things like oh well, i'll be with my friends in hell there ain't no friends in hell because friendship's a good thing and there are no friends in hell your friend in hell that person in hell when all grace is stripped away from him would just as much slit your throat as anything else no graces will be there will be no friendship in hell there will be no love in hell there'll be none of those things in which god has set a standard and he set the standard and says live by it folks live by it but sin has come and corrupted but thank God that God has redeemed us from that sin. And that's where we get to our other two points. Because now you're a child of God and now you have a new relationship to this sin. You have a new relationship to rebellion. And you have a reason for that relationship. Let me get into the reason for this new relationship that you have with this sin. You have a new master. You have a new nature. And you have a new destiny. That's the reason you are now incompatible with sin you have a new master a new nature and a new relationship you see the purpose jesus came into this world was to remove sin and to take away the uh the work that satan accomplished look here in verse five it says you know that he appeared you know that he appeared in order to take away sins and in him there is no sin. See, you have a new master, and there's a new ruler of this world, Jesus, who came down, who won back everything that Adam lost. He's not just the second Adam, he's the last Adam. And his will is going to be done in this world. You know, in verse 5 again, it says, You know that he appeared in order to take away sin. In uh, sin is uh, sorry. You know that he appeared in order to take away away sins, and in him there's no sin. Sin is antithetical to Jesus Christ's mission, and Jesus Christ's nature. It's antithetical to his mission, and it's antithetical to his nature. In verse seven, it says, "Little children, let no one deceive you. Whoever practices righteousness is righteous." And as he is righteous, whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil. For the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God peer, appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. That's his mission statement. He's going to accomplish it. And he's actually going to accomplish it whether you like it or not, or whether you're on board with it or not. Turn for just a moment to Luke chapter 9. In verse 51 and this is what we must understand is that Jesus has a mission and he's going to do this mission whether we like it or not in verse 51 it says when the days drew near for him to be taken up he set his face to go to Jerusalem some people some translations said that he used to set his face as flint or he set his face as stone it meant that he resolved to go to Jerusalem. There was no question in his mind that he was going to go to this cross. And in verse 52, it says, And he sent messengers ahead of him who went and entered the village of the Samaritans to make preparations for him. And here's the point. The people did not receive him because his face was set towards Jerusalem. Do you understand that? He was on a mission and he didn't care who was in his way. These Samaritans wanted him to do what they wanted him to do. But they didn't like him because he was on his own mission. And we deal with that today. People like Jesus as long as they think Jesus is going to do what they want Jesus to do. 
As long as Jesus is going to bless their ministry or bless their ideology or bless what they have on the schedule or as long as Jesus is on their team, but Jesus says, I'm not on anybody's team. I'm on my own team. I am going to do what I came to do. And there's going to be no deterrent. And he's still doing that today. He went to the cross and now he's working toward making this world a new place and a new heavens and a new earth to totally destroy the works of the devil. But people don't like that. They only like it if they think they can get something out of it, but they don't like it. They only like it if they think they can get something out of it. And I think I can get something out of it. But you see, what I think I can get something out of is the result of the new nature I have, right? I think that as, as a result, I, like I want the new kingdom. I want the new kingdom. I want the new heavens and the new earth. I want a healed body. I want all of that stuff. But I also want Christ. What the world wants to offer is all that stuff without Christ, without Jesus. They want to offer everything that is a result of peace, but without holiness. They're like the son in the prodigal story. They come and they say, Father, give me your inherit, give my, my portion of the inheritance now. And what does he do when he receives the portion of the inheritance? Does he say, oh, I'll move next door so that I can be close to the Father? No, you see, he moves far away into, a, into another country and he squanders those goods. He wanted what the Father could give him, but not the Father himself. And these people, they want what Jesus can give them but they don't want Jesus and they get upset when Jesus says, no, I'm doing it my way. I'm not doing it your way. And he's on a mission to destroy the work of the devil. Turn to Matthew chapter 13. Sorry, Matthew chapter 12. And the backdrop in verse 22 is there is a demon-possessed person and Jesus heals this demon-possessed person and they accuse him of being, of working on the side of the devil. And know what he says, notice what he says here in verse 25. It says, knowing their thoughts, he said to them, every kingdom divided against itself is laid to waste and no city or house divided against itself will stand. And if Satan cast out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then will the kingdom of God stand? If I cast out demons by Beelzebub, by who do your sons cast them out? Therefore, they will be your judges. But if, but it, if it is by the Spirit of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Or how can someone enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man? Then indeed he may plunder his house. Here's what Jesus is saying here. He's saying, you know why I'm able to do what I'm able to do in this world? It's because I have bound the strong man. I have bound the owner of this house. The, not, the, 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 not the owner in the creative sense, but the legal ownership that Satan took when he tricked Adam and Eve into eating the fruit, or he caused the rebellion, tricked Eve, Adam rebelled willfully. He won legal control over this, and Jesus is saying, I'm taking this back. The kingdom, if I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. I have bound the strong man, and now I am able to plunder his goods. You know, you're part of that. You're part of that. Your mission here on earth is to do what Jesus asked us to do in the Great Commission. How are we able to do this? Because Jesus has all authority. He's saying, I've bound the strong man. Go. Now, he didn't say it was going to be easy. He didn't say that you weren't going to have opposition. He didn't say that Satan is bound in every way possible. He didn't say that. But he did say it's bound in, in, he, it's bound in this way, that Jesus will accomplish his will for this world he will accomplish his will for this world and as long as you're on board with that and you're going forward and you're he's not accomplishing his will your will for this world 
He's accomplishing his will for this world. I don't know why you're putting your Bible away, sir. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> anyway, please turn to John chapter 12. John chapter 12. Okay, all right. I'm just kidding with you. I shouldn't, I shouldn't have broke the fourth wall like that. <laughs> John chapter 12. Yeah, we are, aren't we? And in verse 27, actually, we can skip down to verse 31. This was a voice from heaven, but Jesus said, Now is the judgment of this world. Now will the ruler of this world be cast out. And when I, I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all people to myself. You see, now is the time in which Satan is cast out. Now, of course, he's, we know that he's not cast out permanently. He's not cast out in the sense that he can't do anything in this world. But he is cast out in the sense that the gospel mission, which Jesus puts us on, will be accomplished. The reason why you now have a new, a new relationship with sin and the new relationship you have with sin is incompatible is because we have a new master who's on a new mission. And here's the second reason. You have a new nature. You have a new nature. Turn back to 1 John chapter 3. You are not the same as you used to be. You have a new nature that's patterned after the nature of Christ. And verse 6, it says, No one abides in him keeps on sinning. No one who keeps on sinning has either seen uh, uh, no one who keeps on no one who keeps on sinning who keeps on sinning has either seen him or known him little children let no one deceive you whoever practices righteousness is righteous as he is righteous whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil for the devil has been sinning from the beginning the reason the son of man appeared was to destroy the work of the devil no one born of god makes a practice of sinning, for God's seed abides in him. See, you have a new nature. You have a new seed. That's probably a euphemism for the new birth that's being said here. Certainly, it includes that. But you have a new nature, and now this new nature, along with grace, has set you apart from sin, and it's made your relationship with sin different. Now, we still have this relationship with sin. We still struggle with sin, but it's now a different relationship that we have. The example that we have of it being totally different is the example of a jailer and, and, and his subject in the jail cell, okay? So you have a jailer, and then you have his subject in the jail cell. Well, let's say, you know, you're behind foreign lines, you're in enemy territory, and you're the jailer and you've caught this foreign foreign person and they're now in your jail they're now and now the navy seals come along and they rescue this person and now they're gone now he was barking orders he was like this is when you sleep this is when you eat this is when you do this this is when you get up this is what you do he's barking orders that's the old relationship you had with sin now this person's gone he's out and 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 the jailer is over and this is the prisoner escaped. He escaped. And now you walk out and he's still barking orders at you. Get back in here. But you see, you've got a new relationship. You've been freed. It's not that you don't have that relationship still. He's still barking orders at you. He still wants you to get back in the cell. He still wants you to do all the things you used to do. But you now have a different <laughs> relationship with that jailer because your Messiah has set you free Praise God, and he sets you free to live a life of holiness. I want you to see two verses on this. Turn to Titus chapter 2. Two is part of 12, so. <laughs> In verse 11, it says, For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people. 
draining. Oh, I'll wait. And verse 11 says, For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age, waiting for our blessed hope and the appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. You see, grace now is over you, and grace is training you. And grace now, instead of law, instead of the devil, grace now is training you to renounce these ungodly things. But it's training. You understand? It's training. You're not trained to do this. It's not part of your old nature. You've got a new nature, and you've got to train it into you. This is why it says practice. That word there is not in the Greek. It, it's, it's an additive word to get you the idea in back in First John where it says, but those who practice, it's poion, it's doing, but it's in the present continuous sense. Like if I say, I do martial arts, you know what that means. I practice martial arts. I'm, I'm a practitioner of it. But maybe you've had the situation where you've had a martial arts student come from a radically different style and then try to do your style. You ever had that happen? And they've got to be retrained. They're not used to standing that way. They're not used to throwing the kicks in a certain way. They're not used to doing that a certain way. They have to be trained. You have to practice righteousness is what the text says. You have to do it on a continual basis. That's why they get the word practice in there. You have to practice righteousness. You have to go throughout your day practicing now, please understand this. I know I've made a big deal about not being involved in what's called white knuckle Christianity. Okay, I white, you know, like white knuckle, and you white knuckle, and you're like, ah, oh, I can't handle it. You know, you just tough through it. I want us to be joy filled Christians where we're just we just have the joy of the Lord, and that's that's getting us to where we want to go. That's getting us to our destination. Don't be mistaken in the fact that there isn't going to be white knuckle moments in your life. Are there not going to be times where you just have to tough it? You have to practice. It's difficult to do. You have to get up and you have to read your Bible and you have to listen to that sermon. You have to take notes on that sermon and you have to read your notes on that sermon. And you have to go, you have to practice righteousness. You have to drive down the street and go, I'm going to practice today not yelling at the idiots in front of me. I'm going to practice. You understand it's not always easy. It's worth it. And joy should be our ultimate motivator in driving us. But I don't want you to think that there's this sense, sense where there's never going to be white knuckle moments in your life where you have to dig in and do the work. You have to. It's training. Just like if you were training somebody at the range or you're training somebody in a martial arts school or you're training them, they're not used to standing a certain way. They're not used to holding positions in a certain way. They're not used to doing these things in a certain way. They've been trained their whole life another way. And it's same with us, even us that have been in Christianity for a long time. It's practice. And sometimes practice is difficult. It's worth it. But sometimes it's difficult and you have to discipline yourself. You have to say, I'm going to read my Bible today even when I don't want to read it. I'm going to pray today even though I don't want to pray today. Even though it's easier for me to sit in this chair and watch television. It's easier for me to play video games. It's easier for me to do whatever it is you fill in the X. We all have those in our lives. And they all have a place in our lives. I'm not saying any of them don't have a place in our lives. But we all know that there are times where we're like, you know, I know I shouldn't be, I know I should be going over my notes. I know I should be practicing righteousness. And just like instructors, you know, instructors, I come in, oh, well, I practiced all week. No, you didn't. No, you didn't. You tell me you practice all week. We, 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 would, we would be able to tell the difference if you practiced all week. Well, because practicing is difficult. It's hard and it's so easy so easy just to let the world and, and, and our lower indulgences and our lower mind and our lower self just kind of wash over us. But we are called to practice righteousness. We're called to be trained by righteousness. Turn to Ephesians. I have two more points I want to make here. Turn to Ephesians chapter 4. I want to make one more point on this and I want to close 
as far as some closing thoughts are concerned on deception. But you see, you have a new nature. The Spirit of God has been born in you. And in verse 20, it says, But that is not the way of Christ. And verse 21 says, Assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him, the truth is in Jesus. To put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds and to put on the new self created after the likeness of God in the true righteousness in holiness. You see, we have this new nature and John says it here. If you go back to 1 John and we'll kind of wrap this up here with a few more closing thoughts you have a new you have a new nature and your new nature is that you have been born of God and God's seed abides in you and that there should be a marked difference between the person you were and the person that you are and the person that you're becoming and if there isn't a marked difference then this is exactly the place that people try to deceive you now that marked difference might not look like right away like somebody just gets saved right? They just, they, they, they get saved. They receive Christ as Lord and Savior. It's a true, genuine conversion. That difference might not be astounding right at the beginning. Now, sometimes it is. Sometimes, you know, there people are throwing their drugs down the toilet. And, you know, I mean, th that happens sometimes, but sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes it's a growing process. I often look at it like this, like what the world will become and what the world was. When, when Eve sinned and Adam sinned, the world probably looked the same way, like right at first. It probably, there probably wasn't this marked difference right at first. But then eventually it got bad. It got bad quickly, but it wasn't like they looked around and things were just completely different. And when Jesus came into the world and died on the cross and rose again from the dead and ascended into heaven, you, probably if you looked around right then, you'd be like, okay, they didn't look like a big difference. But look at it 2,000 years from now, 2,000 years from now, Jesus said every tribe, tongue, and nation will hear about the gospel and how we've, we've just promulgated this, this world with opposition, with, yes, with opposition, with struggle, with times of victory, with times of defeat, but overall the gospel message has been pushed forward in this world. And it's pushed forward in this world because the same thing happens to us. When we see, see Christ as Lord and Savior, well, it doesn't look too different right at the beginning. But five years down the road, well, I'm not watching the same shows I used to watch. It's like I was living with my girlfriend, you know what, and I just couldn't live with my girlfriend anymore because I knew that God was not happy with this. And a little while later, then you're like, well, you know what, I, I'm going to come to church. But you know what, now I'm on the worship team. And now I'm in discipleship training. And now I'm training other people. See, it's a progressive sanctification that happens, that happens in our lives. And this, is, and, and this needs to be seen because this is exactly where people want to deceive you. Look here in verse 7. It says, Little children, let no one deceive you. Whoever practices righteousness is righteous as he is righteous. Whoever practices righteousness who makes a practice of sinning is of the devil. Okay, that's this is exactly where people want to deceive you. As a matter of fact, we have a whole doctrine, I've brought this up before, you've heard about this before, of what's called non-lordship salvation. That you can receive Jesus Christ as Savior and not as Lord, and have you can even blaspheme God and 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 publicly proclaim that you don't believe him but if they got you to say that prayer and even for one second you believed it and even for one second you believed that you're saved you have the gift of salvation you just haven't received the gift of the lordship of jesus christ that's a blasphemous that's a that's exactly what he's talking about here this is a way in which you, people will try to deceive you and we and this has been in recent years this has been like since around the 60s that that came out you know this is it 
been older than that too. There have been other forms, but this new non-lordship salvation belief is a recent belief. And it's a doc, they'll try to make doctrines out of it. And they'll, they'll write, they write books on this. Zane Hodges has written a book on this about how you can be saved and have it not affect your life at all. No, this is exactly where people want to deceive you. And, it's re and you'll be deceived in doctrine, you'll be deceived in example, and you'll be deceived in false assurance. They'll assure these people, oh, but you did say it. You were four years old and your parents talked you into saying, they, they could have talked you into thinking that Bozo the Clown was your personal clown. But instead of saying Bozo the Clown, they said Jesus and you accepted that. And now you don't love Jesus and you're, you blow up school children and, you know, you do all that stuff. But he, but, but he, I know he's saved. I know he's saved because he said the sinner's prayer when he was four years old. He said the words. Yeah, he said the words, and he meant them even for a second. No, I'm sorry. If there's no marked difference now, again, and we've seen this before, it's not that though somebody's saved and lost. That's not the argument here. The argument is truly saved people will continue in their sanctification. It's a ride, man. It's a ride. I mean, there are going to be times where there are good times. There are going to be times where there are bad times. But the progress, just like the gospel progress in this world, is forward. It's forward. It's going to be valleys. There's going to be hills. There's going to be fights. There's going to be things that happen and go on in your life. But the overall progress of your life is, it's not going to be perfection, but it's going to be direction. The direction of your life is towards this new destiny brought about by your new nature, brought about by your new master. Let's pray. Uh, dear Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you so much that you have come to deliver us from this bondage of sin, from this bondage of sin and death. Lord, we know that you're making way in this world, and we know that you're making way in our lives, and although we don't see it at times, Help us rest in the fact that you are king and help us be on board with what you're doing in this world and not what we want you to do in this world. So we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now